that ever been in my sophomore year? I think so. <laughs> everybody was easy this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. This is a. I mean, we all learn about Christopher Columbus in school, of course, and the age of discovery, but man, there's so much that I've forgotten, that I've forgotten about, or that I never learned about. And I, I've been reading this really great book, The Expansion of Europe, Motives, Methods, and Meanings, from the 60s, I think, what is it from, 1967. So it's probably very out of date, but it's a collection of book excerpts and essays from like the early 20th century, and wow, there's just so much that I learned. It's, it's very cool, it's very interesting. Um, but let's begin with prayer, and then we are going to dig in. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, we live here in America, the New World, named after Amerigo Vespucci. Thank you, God, that, uh, that here we found religious freedom, our, our ancestors and forefathers, and that here we can freely practice our Christian faith in the Lutheran heritage. Thank you now that we can study your word and learn about this uh, very important epic from world history and from church history. And we ask that you guide our discussion and bless us. In the, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, the age of discovery. This is a really cool part of history. I mean, it might be one of the most I probably say this every week, but this is maybe my new favorite period of history. It's just so fascinating. Think about, I mean, it's it's sometimes scary to like row across, you know, Hall Lake if you're in a really rickety old boat or something. And you think about the, the big catfish that might nibble on you or if you get caught out and, you know, you another boat collides with you. Imagine sailing in a little <clears throat> caravel which was, were tiny boats, you know, compared to modern, compared to what we think today of a of an ocean-going boat. These caravels were like, you know, there are boats in Lake Okoboji that are bigger than bigger than these caravels. And think about taking one of those across the entire Atlantic Ocean. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, it's they so didn't exciting. know it was that. They didn't know it. there was ever going. Did they? Yeah. Well, they they there. That's interesting, Kathy. For decades and decades and centuries, there were rumors about uh, the Isle, Isle of Brazil, which we're gonna talk about, that there were rumors floating around in Bristol and England about the Isle of Brazil. And then there were rumors um, about uh, Isle of Brazil, and then this, oh, what's it called? The Island of the Seven Cities. So that was another thing that sailors had supposedly seen in the early Middle Ages or witnessed. And there was Leif Erikson's discovery of Canada in like, the 11th century, and then before him, Eric the Red discovered Greenland. So they're all people. They thought there was something over there. They did not know what they were going to find, and that's why someone like Christopher Columbus thought that he was going to find the coasts of Asia. Right? He thought that he was going to discover China, India. Uh, um, that's why they're called the Indians, right? Because he thought that they were island groups off the coast of India, but. Yeah, they didn't know what they were going to find, but they are pretty sure that they were going to find something, it seems like. But we're going to get into the background a little bit more because it's very interesting. Um, so here's a, a different painting. This is, uh, this is a um, Nanban, or I'm sorry, it's a Japanese painting of Nanban, and Nanban is the Japanese word for southern barbarians, Portuguese or Spanish sailors. I, somehow, somehow the top part of that got cut off. It was supposed to say Japanese Yobu of Nanban, and then Nanban literally means southern barbarians. For example, the Portuguese or Spanish sailors who reached Japan in the mid 16th century. And then it's called a Biobu because a Biobu is a style of Japanese panel art. So you've probably seen that. There are all these wooden panels, and then there are all these beautiful scenes on the panels and cherry blossoms and birds. So that's from a Nanban um, from the early 17th century. And the Portuguese first reached Japan in 1543 by accident. They got blown off course and shipwrecked. And then a, 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 crew, of Jap a crew of Portuguese sailors reached the southern 
southernmost island of Japan, which is really interesting. But usually I don't have Eastern art there. Usually I have Western art for us to look at. But it's cool to see that I love Japanese art. Okay, uh, scriptural starting places. Let's start at Isaiah 49, verse 6. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the reserve of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the world. Okay, so your translation is King James. It says Gentiles. In Hebrew, it's ha goyim, and goy. You maybe learn that from like fiddler on the roof or yentl or something. A uh, goy is is a gentile, right? A non-Jew. Um, but my ESV has it translated as nations because the goyim or the gentiles is synonymous with the nations. It means those people groups outside of the nation of Israel. And then um, there's also that bit about to the end of the earth, right? So you can see here right now why we're why we'd be looking at this passage from the prophet Isaiah during a lecture on the course of discovery. It's that the Christians uh, alive in the beginning of this period, we call it the early modern or the Renaissance or the late late Middle Ages. They truly believe that it was their responsibility to discover new lands they knew existed because where there was land, there most likely were peoples and kingdoms that. That Christianity had not penetrated yet, and they wanted to reach those areas with the light of the gospel, and to and to save to save those unknown peoples from eternal damnation. And they saw the justification in the Old and New Testaments, where God promises that His salvation will reach the ends of the earth. They thought that they were there. They, being the European explorers, thought that they were instruments of this purpose. And then also Micah four verse three. <clears throat> He will judge between many people and arbitrate for mighty nations far away. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. No nation will rise a sword against them, and people will not learn to fight anymore. Okay, and then the other important theme from the Old Testament is the day of the Lord, the Yom Yahweh, as it is in Hebrew. Yom The day of the Lord is a common reoccurring idea in all of the minor prophets, and it has eschatological significance. That means it, it deals with the latter days. That's what Micah says at the beginning of the chapter. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the nations will stream to the mount of the Lord, the nations will come to Zion, the nations will join Israel in their worship of the one true God. And so Presumably, if you're a European and you're alive in the mid-15th century and you've heard about all these distant lands and you know that um, the Muslim, the Muslim uh, peoples keep encroaching upon Europe, you might think, well, there are all these people groups that the Muslims will conquer and they will never hear about the light of the gospel. To make all of this a reality, uh, it would behoove us to reach those peoples and to not only can we convert them, but we can make alliances with them against the Muslims and destroy, you know, destroy the Mohammedans eventually. So there are all these factors and ideas kind of swirling together at this time, but the Old Testament presents a clear picture that the nations, the Gentiles, people to the ends of the earth, people to the ends of the earth will, will receive the light of the gospel. They will receive salvation. And so in the European mind, uh, that was in, uh, an indication that they should go and reach those people with the gospel, right? Uh, and then Acts would be the other important place in the scriptures, so specifically Acts 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So there you go. So what was was foreseen by Isaiah and Micah and the minor prophets is then confirmed by our Lord himself uh, speaking to his disciples on the Mount of Ascension as Luke records in the beginning of the book of Acts. So Jesus himself says, you will be my witnesses. 
you will will spread the gospel to Judea and Samaria. You know, Samaria was like like Mormon country to the Jews. You know, like, like the way that Jews looked at looked at Samarians as kind of as Samaritans as kind of a a corrupted Jewish sect that that denied the major tenets of Judaism. That's kind of how Christians today look at Mormons as a corrupt Christian sect that have denied some of the major tenets. Christianity. And weren't a lot of the Samaritans derived from Jews that had married into the neighboring heathen nations, and they then the Jews were supposed to cast them out. And that's that's my imagination of the Samaritans. Yeah, the Samaritans actually first arose after the Assyrian conquest and the Assyrian exile in the eighth century BC. So. Well, while Judea was still an intact kingdom, here's the most simple map of Israel. Uh, so Judea draws a straight line here. Judea is all of this area to the Negev Desert. While this was still an intact nation under the southern kings, the Assyrians came in and captured and then exiled the inhabitants of the northern kingdom, Israel. Pockets of Jews that were there that intermarried with Assyrians, presumably, or possibly with Canaanite tribes, eventually, through a kind of unknown and complicated historical process, a Jewish like religion arose. They worshiped on Mount Gerizim instead of Mount Zion. Oops. Instead of Mount Zion. Um, they only accepted the first five books of the, of the Old Testament, the Torah. And they rejected all of the prophetic literature and all of the historical literature and all of the writings. So Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, they rejected all of that. Um, and then they have different customs that are somewhat like Jewish customs, but are also very different. So that's why during Jesus' day, eventually the Assyrians go away, the Babylonians go away, the Persians go away, the Greeks come, the Greeks go, then the Romans eventually come. But during Jesus' day, when you have kind of a more homogenous Jewish culture again throughout the land. That's why you have such president prejudice against the Samaritans because they arose more recently and they denied the oral law. They denied um, the rest of the Old Testament. So yeah, they were regarded with a lot of suspicion. But I guess short answer would be kind of Alan, 8th century post-Assyrian conquest. 720 <coughs> <clears throat> yeah, I think that, yeah, around there. Um, but yeah, okay, so Jesus says, you'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Um, missionaries and priests and monks who, who see themselves as the inheritors of the apostolic witness, that, that command obviously uh, applies to them as well. Just like we read that and we think that, you know, we're to be Christ's witnesses ourselves. I mean, every generation of Christians reads this and believes that it applies to them. In other words, we don't read this and think, oh, that's, oh, that's just the 12 apostles. I'm off the hook. I don't have to spread the good news. And the ends of the earth, if we were to find an uninhabited island off the coast of, or a, a, an island off the coast of Antarctica that was inhabited and had never received the gospel, we wouldn't have to do anything because this command just applies to the apostles. We don't believe that, obviously. Something happened in our teaching because we kind of, the average church member kind of got the feeling kind of that, well, that's the pastor's job. Yeah. And we miss that whole priesthood of believers, you know. Mm -hmm. Kind of like our. Did you call them a responsibility in order to. Yeah, I kind of feel like the, pa the pastor should kind of watch while things are happening in church and then kind of. You know, be the be the shepherd that is like the teacher and the one to, to kind of gently lead and rule the flock. But pastors should almost have no say at all in you know what is modified in the building or what carpet is put down or what people do in the community or what missionary. You know, like lay. Yeah, you're right. You know, lay people should do that. Sometimes uh, it's like working with animals. You need an electric prod. <laughs> that Indeed. might get us going. Yeah. Where is that in the Bible? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> the shepherd's staff yeah. used to not only rescue.
you, but yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Acts ten thirty-five. God accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. All right, so this is, yeah, that's right. Every nation, whoever fears God and does what is right, is accepted by God. So this is the story of Peter and Cornelius, the Roman centurion. And this is a turning point in the book of Acts because Peter has this vision of this sheet in the air filled with unclean animals. And then God says to Peter, uh, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's like, my mouth has never touched anything that's been unclean. And then, and then Jesus says, what God has made clean, do not call common. So that's an indication that after the ascension of Jesus, all animals have been made clean. And these old purity and dietary laws for the Jews are now fulfilled uh, in the lamb who was slain. Hey, you kind of forgot, too, that what comes out of the heart, yeah. they can hold because... They only looked at what goes into, and of course, the mind and soul and everything like that. But uh, it was easy to judge what I what I eat and what I do myself. But <coughs> this thing down here is the where the, the problems lie. Exactly. Exactly. This is a well. I call it a turning point because it is Cornelius is welcomed into the kingdom of heaven along with his whole household and his children, and his little children are baptized because that's that's what would have happened a household doesn't just mean the adult members it means every age including infants and babies even um, his servants and his servants yep everyone was everyone was baptized even though they were you know pagans and gentiles um but that was that's what our lord commanded and uh that verse there in ever in any nation god accepts those uh in but in every nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to him. So that includes the godless, you know, Indians of the New World. Uh, that includes the Africans uh, south of the Sahara that Europeans never met previously, right, before the late 15th century. That includes the Aztecs. That includes everybody. Except the Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> I hope the I hope the microphone didn't pick that up. Um, and then let's go to Acts seventeen twenty six. For one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set from men and the exact places where they should live. So isn't that interesting? Now, so this is Paul talking now uh, to the Athenians um, at the Areopagus, and Areopagus or Mars Hill could either be the literal hill or it could be like a meeting place, uh, a, a group, a group of men, or it could be both. So scholars are kind of divided on the Areopagus. Was that a place? Was that a meeting group, like a discussion group? Or was it both a place and a discussion group? Um, but we commonly say, we commonly say like, you know, he was, uh, he was at Mars Hill or something, but the verse 22 says Paul standing in the midst of the Areopagus. It sounds like the Areopagus was a discussion group, kind of like an early, um, not university, but a, a group of learning. But here Paul, Paul connects everything back to Adam, right? That every race, every group of people, no matter where they live, in Greece or in the Holy Land, is descended from Adam and Eve. And that's actually that's actually kind of a controversial controversial thing to say today in 2021 that there's one race, the human race, and that we're all descended from Adam and Eve. But that's what Paul says to the Athenians, and so that's what we should confess the rest of our lives. And that means that the Indians or the Chinese or the Japanese to the Europeans, you know, during the Age of Discovery, or the Sub-Saharan Africans or whoever they encountered, were also children of Adam children of Adam and Eve and so created by God and given gifts by God and lands by God were allotted to them and it was the Europeans duty to spread the gospel to teach the gospel to them and a lot of the European rulers and kings really took this seriously they were like I think the modern picture of the of like Isabella and Ferdinand for example of Castile and Aragon uh, the modern picture is one of duplicity duplicitousness duplicity 
where the, the monarchs were like, like, go, we'll send missionaries, we'll convert the natives. But we're really just in for the gold. Uh, don't forget to build churches, guys. Look at the, all this gold we just found. You know, but it was actually probably the opposite, that most of the rulers believed that if it was their sovereign duty to convert these peoples and to uh, spread peace and justice in the land, the Spanish actually had all sorts of laws that they that they established in the uh, in the Indies, for example, and in places like Cuba, Hispaniola, the Bahamas, uh, to stop like cannibalism and uh, um, rape and polygamy and murder. I mean, they they were they really they really were trying. They had the they had the right intention to spread peace, truth, and justice to these new lands. It's just that a lot of the merchants and explorers. And by a lot, I mean, you know, very many were in it only for greed. Now, all, all those expeditions had to have with them a pastor or a priest of some kind. Yeah. You know, uh, even uh, when uh, Darwin said he was hired as a pastor and a map maker to, to go on that voyage. And he got sidetracked. And, There's actually a really interesting letter we have from, I want to say, early 16th century, like 1510s, from a group of uh, explorers and settlers in Florida, and they wrote back to the king and queen of Spain requesting that they send a professional theologian to them in the swamps of Florida, because they were encountering natives and they had some kind of questionable moral things, and and in, and I, they probably had a they had men of God, they had priests, but they needed like a, a professor, a scholar, yeah, a scholar, a professor from a university, a theologian from a university to come and help them with these questions that they had, which is so interesting. I mean, we don't. Well, we do that today. We said, how many of our, our doctors, divinity doctors, to foreign countries to help establish seminaries? And stuff sure. Like that all over the place. Sure, but this would be the equivalent of like if we found Martians and the Martians had some strange practice that the space explorers didn't understand and then the space explorers wrote back to the President of the United States and said, send us a theologian to, because we don't know how to proceed here. Yeah. We're not sure what's right and what's wrong and we need a, someone who can accurately you know, explain the word of God to us and, and, uh, and apply it to the situation. So it's, it's very interesting. It, it, during the... During this time, yeah, theologians were in high demand, and priests and monks did go along with every expedition. There are the 12, the 12 apostles to Mexico, 12 Franciscan missionaries that established monasteries and uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing like schools and orphanages in Mexico. But, but the missionaries, once again, and the, and the monks were kind of the main uh, uh, shock troops, if you will, of the European powers going in there often being getting killed by the natives and terrorized by them but sent in to spread the gospel to establish god's word okay um so let's go into a little bit of background here the norsemen under eric the red you see he lived somewhere between 950 and 1003 did it's supposed to say did settle in greenland and his son leif erickson uh, leads an expedition that settles in what is modern day Newfoundland. These expeditions do not lead to any major shifts in the European mindset, nor to any technological or cultural advancements. So the Norsemen were way ahead of France and, and Spain and Portugal uh, by 500 years, essentially. 500 years before the age of discovery, Norsemen established settlements in Greenland, and then they go all the way to Newfoundland. Canada and established settlements. But, and those were some of the stories then that existed in the European imagination that people talked about, but they didn't lead to any major discoveries, new people groups, new wars. With an Icelandic boat that can only fit, I don't know, 20 people, uh, you're not gonna, you're not gonna 
lead to a huge, uh, <clears throat> a huge settlement, you know, with 20 people, especially because boats, the, the, the Icelandic boats or the, Nor the Nordic boats were much slower than the later caravels of the Portuguese. So they didn't really lead to anything. It just led to some scattered stories, I would say. Marco Polo, however, is far more significant to European history. Uh, his travel log, he, he traveled you know, through, through Persia, through India, he traveled up into China, met all these different people groups, heard so many different languages, saw different religions, and he wrote a book, The Travels of Marco Polo, uh, published it in England and uh, Europe, and that travelogue really extended Europe's knowledge of Eastern lands and customs. The book will have a significant influence on the European drive to establish a sea route <coughs> in Eastern Asia. So Marco Polo is much more important here than Leif Erikson that a lot of Europeans didn't even know existed. Okay, but everyone knew Marco Polo, and everyone had read his book or read about his book. And the, to them, the East seemed just exotic and rich, and powerful. Um, 1419 is a pretty useful starting date for the Age of Discovery. 1419. Because that's the year that marks the Portuguese conquest of, of um, I should have I listened to a pronunciation of this, but Coita, C-E-U-T-A, Coita? guessing so uh, if uh, this is Spain okay and this is North Africa Coita is right here so Portugal sent sent uh, Portugal Prince Henry the navigator that's what he's called he sent his two his two sons wanted to go on a crusade and Prince Henry was like Portugal we've only existed for a hundred years 200 years I don't, I don't remember what Portugal was called wait I do the Battle of Lisbon was in, um, I should know this. Battle of Lisbon was in, anybody know Battle of Lisbon? Nobody's gonna argue with you. <laughs> <laughs> well anyways, Portugal had only existed a short time after Lisbon was conquered from the Moors, okay? So, so in the 700s, Muslims from North Africa had gone into the Iberian Peninsula and it had gone to you know the gates of Gaul and the uh, the uh, early um, uh, Carolingian Empire, which didn't exist yet, but it, it will in a little bit. Charles Martel beat them back, and then after Charles Martel, they just got pushed back a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more until Portugal, and then there was a crusade against Lisbon. And this was conquered and made into a new country, and the Muslims were pushed back into North Africa. Well, in 1419, Prince Henry the Navigator sends his two sons, who have crusade hunger, uh, to Coita on the North African coast border by Morocco, and they capture it with seven lost lives. So it was a very easy battle for them. I don't think the, the Muslim defenders of Coita were expecting this, and uh, the Portuguese just rushed them and captured the city with only seven casualties. Um, uh, so, and then, and then Prince Henry the Navigator sent expeditions into the Atlantic and they discover over here, Madeira and the Azor, Azores Island group, okay? So Portugal then claims these islands, Madeira and the Azores. Um, and then eventually, uh, Prince Henry the Navigator starts sending ships down this way because past this little bulge in Africa, no European had ever had ever sailed past that bulge. Uh, there is a rumor that the sea here was filled with dragons and serpents, sea monsters, and that it was actually impossible that the that the waters were boiling, and so no ship could actually sail there. It would just instantly be engulfed in waves, and then the sailors would meet their doom with the monsters. So no one had ever sent. Uh, ships, but at the same time 1419 Prince Henry the navigator begins to fund expeditions and send ships down the west coast of Africa With a number of objectives one of them was just curiosity You know what is down there? Is it possible to send ships that far? south past this Cape 
you know, into the boiling green seas with sea monsters? What's going to happen if we go down there? Um, so there's kind of a scientific objective because this area was completely unknown to Europeans. Also, um, Prince Henry wanted to seek new countries for Portugal to trade with. Makes sense. Also, Prince Henry and the Europeans wanted to outflank the Moors. Okay, or the 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 Muslims of North Africa. So the thought was, well, if we can get around behind them, you know, maybe we can outflank them and then surround them and pincer attack them or just or, or whatever. Um, and then also, here's a really interesting objective. The Portuguese and Prince Henry specifically really did believe in the existence of a Christian king of Africa named Prester John. And Prester John is a very shadowy and, and, and intriguing figure from the Middle Ages. Uh, Prester is from the word pres, presbyter, okay? And traditionally, Prester John was John himself. So there was a legend in Europe that John, who to whom Jesus promised would not die um, until his return, right? Or not, not, not exactly, but remember at the end of John's gospel, Jesus says, what is it to you if one of my disciples you know, what is it to you if he remains until I return? So the legend came up that John had not died, right? That after his vision on the Isle of Patmos, he escaped into Asia. And somewhere in Asia or Africa, he was ruling a kingdom that was fabulously wealthy and that he was their Christian king of this kingdom. Uh, hitherto unknown to the Europeans, but... Uh, would prove to be a, a very valuable ally against the Muslims. So the Portuguese were trying to find Prester John and, and establish an alliance with him. It's kind of the opposite for what the disciples did. You know, this idea yeah. that he'd be wealthy and have a wealthy nation and all that kind of stuff. Was yeah. <laughs> yeah. On. Yeah. It was almost, it was almost, the vision was almost of such fabulous wealth that Prester John didn't even. Care, care about it. So, for example, like one of the legends says, you know, he had like an army of elephants and more, you know, so much gold, more gold than all of Europe contained. So it's like he was so blessed by God that he just he had no desire to even do anything with his material wealth or gain more wealth. He was just sitting atop piles and piles of gold and ivory and just kind of waiting for the Christians in Europe to find him and then end up battling the Muslims together. So Prester John, very interesting figure. And Prester John appears on medieval maps and in various sagas and poems. Um, I'm guessing some people just thought he was probably totally made up. Other people saw him as a real Christian king and then probably others saw him as a symbol, a symbol for, you know, presumably, you know, Simon of Cyrene had brought Christianity down into the heart of Africa and so that was part of the Prester John legend as well, that there probably were other Christian nations that had not had contact with the Greco-Roman world or the, you know, the medieval European world and just were existing in other places. And they were partially right. The Chinese did have, you know, cr various Christian uh, leaders, uh, like in the 8th and 9th century, and there were kind of, there were Christian poets in China from, um, um, from the spread of Nestorianism, um, which we didn't really talk about, but there were Christians in India and Christians in China at a very early days. They just did not make contact with the Europeans. Yeah, those traders that went to China and India, just like any time, there's, when you go to another place, there's somebody in your group that knows what to do mm -hmm. and shares the gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't remember, I haven't read the travels of Marco Polo, I kind of want to, but I think when he did travel over to India, he found Christians, and he was very, very surprised by that. So they traced their lineage back to Thomas, the disciple, the apostle of India. And then during the, um, during the 5th century, when Nestorianism was on the rise, that's the doctrine that teaches that Christ's two natures are distinct and separate, and don't exist in a, in a unity, there's not a... There's not a unity, but his two natures, human and divine, are separate and distinct. And he basically would switch on or switch off a nature as he needed. Um, and this was condemned by various ecumenical councils, starting with um, 
the Third Ecumenical Council, uh, Ephesus in 431. But anyways, these Christians who were basically expelled from the Byzantine Empire then spread east and spread Nestorian ideas into modern-day Iran, India, and even up into China. So there were Christians in Asia. You know, there were Christian Indians. And that's sort of what these Europeans expected to find, but they didn't find that. But it was one thing that spurred them on to more discovery. Um, and then finally, uh, the last objective of Prince Henry the Navigator was simply to evangelize unknown people groups. He figured that there are all sorts of people living in Africa that Europeans had never made contact with, and he wanted to convert them, to teach them the faith. All right, um, next I have uh, some key voyages, which I think you'll probably find interesting. This will be a flashback to high school history class. Uh, but maybe you didn't know about this voyage. Sometime between 1481 and 1491, before Christopher Columbus, Bristol fishermen reached the New World. So Bristol is a port on the southern coast of England, near, um, like in between Cornwall and the English Channel, um, uh, near Bogner Regis, which I visited a couple years ago. Um, and these Bristol fishermen made voyages across the Atlantic, and, and scholars today think that the Bristol fishermen did reach Canada, and, and fished off the coast of Canada, and I don't know, I don't know what else they did in Canada, but fished and then returned. But there's a, there's a famous letter called the John Day Letter, which was not discovered until 1955. In the archives, I think it's like Salamanca or something, somewhere here, Portugal or Spain, there's an ar archives in a library or a cathedral, and these two scholars were just reading through letters, and they, they found this letter written by a certain John Day to Christopher Columbus. Where he explain where he explains uh, what Bristol fishermen have been up to, and then he he says this: It is considered certain that this same point of land at another time was found and discovered by those of Bristol who found El Brasil, as you are already aware, which is called Isla de Brasil, and is presumed and believed to be the Tierra Firma which those of Bristol discovered. So supposedly Bristol fishermen discovered the Isle of Brazil. Brazil, which could have been Hispaniola or Cuba, or could have been Florida that they thought was an island. Um, you know, it probably was not Brazil, Brazil, but the Isle of Brazil was um, you know, part of the Bahamas or something. Um, and the Bristol fishermen discovered it 10 years before Columbus. They didn't settle it or kill any of the natives or build a church, um, but they discovered it. So that's another feather out of Columbus's hat but it's very, it's very interesting. In 1488, Portuguese explorer Bartolomeu Dias finally not only sails around the bulge of Africa, but makes it all the way around um, Cape the, Cape, Cape yeah, the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa and reaches the Indian Ocean. So 1488, so it didn't take the Portuguese very long. It took them about 70 years to sail all around Africa and to claim, you know, a lot of these territories, to colonize a lot of these areas. Um, in 1492, Isabella I and Ferdinand II, the Catholic monarchs of, of Castile and Aragon, fund Columbus's trip across the Atlantic in search of a sea route to Asia. So Columbus really thought that he was going to be reaching islands off the coast of India. He thought he was going to be reaching the masses of land that, that Marco Polo talks about in his travel log. After four voyages, Columbus was still convinced that the islands that he discovered, namely the Bahamas, Hispaniola, Jamaica, and Cuba, were outlying islands near Asia. So, pardon me. So, um, you know, Columbus is obviously um, very controversial today. Um, but like almost every single figure during this time period, he's very complicated. On the one hand, he wanted to spread Christianity to these new areas. On the other hand, he, he did want to get rich, and he did have his reputation to be worried about, and he did, you know, he did want a lifelong pension um, from, from the Catholic monarchs. And on the one hand, you know, he wanted to spread <laughs> European justice to these Indians, to these unlearned Indians. And, but on the other hand, you know, he did think that they were lesser people, that they're, they're inferior. Wasn't it about this time, too, that uh, the Portugal and Spanish 
short and we're running out of money. And if everything held in the balance of mm. what he might find and be right. able to build that trade up and then gain that wealth. Yeah, funding these voyages was extremely expensive and and you're right, I mean the, the, the crown the, to fund these voyages, Isabel and Ferdinand had to raise taxes and get creative with their bookkeeping, I suppose. <laughs> Um, at the same, like right before the age of discovery, the Chinese Empire, the, the Ming Dynasty, was fabulously wealthy, and they sent they sent ships all the way to uh, to Africa. So the Chinese had been sending expeditions to India and Africa with these gigantic junks, but nothing came of that because they didn't have the, I guess, the drive or the desire, the creativity of the Europeans. They didn't have the same motives. They just wanted to establish trade and, and explore. But the Chinese, who were so wealthy and under one leader, could have funded expeditions and didn't. And then you have Spain and Portugal that were poorer and more disjointed and, and didn't have the same means of gathering as much revenue, funding more and more and more trips and being creative. And yeah, so finding trade routes. The big thing you sent gold was the spices. I mean, that, yeah. that was what they wanted to Asia. Right, so fun, so funding more trips through through trade with other cultures and bringing back goods that would be desirable in Europe. Yeah, super, super important. 1497, Italian John Cabot, who was actually, uh, yeah, he was Italian, but John Cabot is his anglicized name because he sailed for the English. He explored the coast of Canada. 1498, Portuguese Vasco da Gama reaches India, which is quite a feat. 1512, the Portuguese reached the Spice Islands of Indonesia, and a year later they reached China. 1513, Spanish conquistador Vasco Nunez de Balboa crosses the Panamanian Isthmus and reaches the Pacific Ocean. And then 1519 to 1521 is the conquest of the Aztec Empire under Hernan Cortes, who lived 1485 to 1547. Like every single one of these guys is so controversial especially Cortez and Columbus, but, but all of them. Their motives were mixed. Uh, sometimes the, the first-hand records, the letters and the, and the eyewitness accounts are not always reliable or they're contradictory. Um, it's hard to know exactly, you know, when Cortez encircles a group of, you know, 200 Aztecs and just cuts them down and butchers them. It's hard to know, okay, were they actually eating babies or were the Spanish just saying that they were? And even if they were eating babies or committing other acts of cannibalism or rape or whatever, is it justifiable to just kill them all on the spot? There's all sorts of very hairy questions here uh, surrounding all of these colonial conquests and, and, and voyages of exploration. And that leads us to these two people now, Bartolome de las Casas and um, Toribio Paredes de Benedente de Motolinia. Okay, so one is a Dominican and one is a Franciscan. But Las Casas is a very, very important figure. He was a Dominican. He lived until he was 92. He was the key critic of Spanish and Portuguese colonialism during this time. And he was incendiary in his denunciations and critiques of Spain and Portugal. He wrote a book called A Short Account of the Destruction of the Indies, where he claims that Spanish and Portuguese uh, killed 20 million inhabitants of North and South America and, and the, the islands uh, in, the, in the Caribbean. And that book shocked and horrified Europe with its tales of atrocities against the natives. And like every other figure, Las Casas is also highly controversial. Here's a quote from his book. He says, I, Fray Bartolome de las Casas, or a Casaus, friar of Santo Domingo, who by the mercy of God go about this court of Spain trying to cast this hell out of the Indies to prevent those innumerable souls redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ from hopelessly perishing forever without knowing their creator and saving themselves. So las Casas was a layman and traveled to the New World. And then while he was over there, he, um, he became a friar, a Dominican. And then he made numerous trips in between Spain and then the New World again. At one point, he was made the Bishop of Chiapas, uh, the Bishop of Guatemala. Um, but he only remained Bishop for like five months. And then he left. 
And so in the eyes of many other missionaries and priests in the new, new world, to leave his bishopric was essentially to commit apostasy, to deny the faith. Because if he was called to this, if he was called by the Holy Spirit to serve as the overseer of Guatemala, he should only be allowed to leave it due to poor health or, you know, in, in fear of his life. But he just left it for a different reason. Presumably he left because he wanted to go back to Spain and write more write more books and kind of expose what was going on. Um, so yeah, I mean, he, he, uh, he has all sorts of crazy and shocking stories uh, about what he, what he witnessed. So uh, it's, it's, we are sure that on the mainland, our Spaniards through their cruelties and infamous works have depopulated and desolated more than 10 kingdoms larger than all of Spain, including Aragon and Portugal, all filled with rational men and have left a desert of more land than twice the distance from Seville to Jerusalem, which is over 2,000 leagues. We give this as an accurate and truthful account that in these 40 years, through the above mentioned tyrannies and infernal works of the Christians, more than 12 million souls, men, women, and children have been unjustly and tyrannically killed. And I think I am not deceived in believing that it's really over 15 million. So that number climbs eventually to 20 million, but that's that's almost certainly impossible for the Europeans to have killed 20 million uh, Indians. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, they presumably did kill hundreds of thousands, uh, sometimes um, accidentally through the spread of disease or through the causing of wars. Like if the Europeans come and make an alliance with one people group, but that people group is at war with another people group, and then the Europeans provide arms or something to, to them and then start a war and then hundreds of thousands die. I mean, it's so, so messy. This period is so messy and so controversial. It seems like I remember somebody talking about that some of these you know, leaders of these expeditions were in themselves trying to do good things, but they, all, they kind of lost control of the people they sent out to do their exploring. And yeah. these guys seeing all that gold and wealth, this for myself. We don't have to listen to that guy. <laughs> right, right. I mean, they're just, you know, there's, generally speaking, the missionaries, the priests, the monks that were in the New World did have just motives. They wanted to spread the faith. They wanted to educate. There were, a, there were, you know, terrible. It's not like we, it's not like the Europeans showed up and the Indians were just, you know, dancing around in a circle singing and they would never hurt a fly. I mean, there was can there was documented cannibalism, child sacrifice. I, I don't remember if it's Cortez or who it is, but describes the human sacrifices happening in the Aztec Empire at this time. I mean, they're insane. Like every household, he records, had a corpse of someone that they had sacrificed to their to their demon, to their idol. And, uh, and Montezuma famously had you know human sacrifices involving thousands of people all killed at the same time and sacrificed and burned on this altar before these Aztec deities. Um, so the Europeans show up and they, on the one hand they say, we can help these people, we can save them from demon worship and we can uh, allow them to become cultivated and established in culture, we can educate them, we can give them the faith. But then you have other settlers and merchants and conquistadors thinking, no, we can take advantage of these people and really profit by them and also introduce them to the Christian faith and save them. You have all these weird mixed motives going on. And in the meantime, you do have hundreds of thousands of Indians being killed and dying of disease. Um, really, really sad. But Las Casas is very controversial. Las Casas' opponent was a Franciscan missionary in Mexico named Toribio Parades de Benevente de Motolinia. He's commonly called Toribio de Motolinia, which means Toribio the poor man, um, 1482 to 1568. He challenged the Dominican uh, Las Casas for his frequently inaccurate and misleading account. Motolinia, Mot Motolinia is also a very controversial figure. One of his, he writes a letter to the uh, to the king of Spain, and, and he just roasts, just 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 lays into Las Casas and, and describes him as a liar and and an apostate for leaving his bishopric, and and that Las Casas has never actually cared about the natives, 
He's just using the natives. And in fact, Las Casas has more slaves personally than any conquistador Mogolinia has ever seen. And Las Casas has gone into these areas and, and made all these rules that are so hard uh, for the new converts uh, among the Indians. I mean, he just has accusation after accusation. And it's hard to know if those accusations are all accurate as well. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle, but uh, Modolinia says, therefore we must impede and remove these and other abominations, sins, and offenses that were publicly committed against God and our neighbors and plant our holy Catholic faith and raise the cross of Jesus Christ everywhere in the confession of his holy name. So you see with prominent writers and, and churchmen like Modolinia, there was this motive to spread the Christian faith, not to gain material wealth, not to subjugate peoples and acquire slaves, um, but that only happened imperfectly. Um, interestingly enough, during this time, the popes, in my book of letters from popes, um, the popes were actually very concerned about the, the colonization of the New World, and they actually said some very interesting things. Uh, things that you should know know about. So um, this is from 1537, okay? And it's a, it's a letter called Pastoral Officium, uh, official pastoral letter to the Archbishop of Toledo in 1537. So here's the background. A delegation of Dominicans had complained to Rome that the Spanish colonists were making slaves of the indigenous people of Central America they induced the Pope to defend their fundamental rights. So you don't often hear about this. I mean, <clears throat> modern day, there's just a full broadside. Oh, it's, it's not called Christopher Columbus Day anymore. It's called Indigenous People's Day because Columbus and all those Europeans just killed the Indians and took all their stuff. But here you have a group of prominent theologians, Dominican monk, Dominican friars, writing an official letter to the Pope demanding that the Pope defend the rights of these indigenous peoples against the colonists. So you often see that here it's the colonists, colonists, wait, is that right? No. That looks wrong. Colonists, okay. You have the colonists uh, taking advantage of the Indians, and you have kind of the monks, not all of the monks, but many of the monks, uh, writing to the Pope to try and, right, to try and reel in the colonists and stop their abuses. Um, so here, this is the part of the letter by Paul, Pope Paul III. It has come to our hearing that in order to restrain those who stirred by greed bear an inhuman spirit against the human race, Charles V, the Emperor of the Romans, has prohibited by public edict any of his subjects from presuming to reduce the Western or Southern Indians to slavery or deprive them of their goods. Since we therefore are vigilant that these Indians, even if outside the bosom of the church, are not deprived, nor are they to be deprived of their freedom or their ownership of their goods, for they are men, and therefore capable of faith and salvation. And thus they are not to be destroyed by enslavement, but rather invited to life through preaching and example. And since we, moreover, desire to repress the nefarious undertakings of such impious men, and to ensure that the Indians do not be hard, become hardened against embracing the faith of Christ, made bitter by bad treatment and losses. We demand that under your watchful attention, you prevent with great severity, under pain of excommunication, each and every one of whatever rank, from presuming in any way to reduce the aforementioned Indians to slavery, or in any way to despoil them of their goods. So here we can like give the Pope some applause, because he's trying to protect the Indians uh, the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean and of Central America for being enslaved and despoiled um, and subjugated by the Spanish colonists. Um, and then, uh, oh, I guess that's the only thing I have on that. I thought I had more. I thought there was more. And then there's a papal letter about intermarriage between explorers and, and uh, indigenous peoples. But anyways, kind of an interesting episode of history. You have Popes speaking up for the rights of the indigenous peoples, um, and the colonists just just taking advantage of them. So let's make some conclusions now. Okay, like the Spanish Inquisition, the Age of Discovery is frequently condemned with little or no historical information whatsoever. People just make blanket statements about 
Christopher Columbus or Amerigo Vespucci or Ferdinand and Isabella, etc., and they have no idea what they're talking about. They don't know about someone like Las Casas, who was allowed to publish. I mean, he all of all of Las Casas's writings were so damning of the colonists and of the Spanish explorers, and the Spanish crown allowed him to publish and invited him to the to the throne to, to speak and to present his findings because Isabel and Ferdinand at least were striving after justice and fairness with with the indigenous peoples and they they wanted to establish contact and even settle those areas but did not want to trample on their rights or destroy them or anything like that um, so it's much more complicated than just saying, oh, the Spanish and Portuguese are all bad and they're just trying to take advantage and destroy the Indians. No, it didn't. that didn't happen. Uh, also, the age of discovery was of mixed motives, political, economic, and religious. Though the religious motives perhaps weighed the most, I would say that they did weigh the most. Um, the, religion, the, the Catholic monarchs, Isabella and Ferdinand, and then Prince Henry the Navigator truly did want to spread the gospel. And, and establish schools and monasteries and universities and cathedrals and they, and they did want to save people from from a damnable ignorance from not knowing their Savior Jesus Christ that's interesting isn't it Las Casas even says in that quote I have he says you know Jesus Christ died for these people they just don't know it yet they're they're they don't know their Creator but Jesus still died for them we call that objective justification Objective is the fact that Christ died for all men. Subjective is that I receive this personally through the faith that is given me by the Holy Spirit. Um, so, mixed motives. Uh, the religious authorities were not always perfect, but there were rigid rules in place to protect natives and lead to their instruction and baptism. So, the, the, there's an article in this book on uh, the justice, the system of justice that Spain had for the New World. And it was very, very, very rigorous. I mean, if you were a Spanish colonist and you took advantage of a native in some way or enslaved him unjustly or whatever, you were, the rules were harsher than they were in Europe. So the rules against Spanish people were harsher in the New World than they were in Europe for enslavement and rape and other things, other crimes like that. And a lot of the colonists were summarily executed uh, because they took advantage of natives. There was a harsh system of justice in place. It wasn't always followed correctly. It was often abused, but nevertheless, it existed, and the monarchs tried to strive yeah, for justice. Some of those <clears throat> got by with it because they knew uh, to get a new decree from Europe is going to take several months before it gets over here. So I got a lot of playtime. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I mean, just like anything, like just like anything, there, there, humans always have mixed motives. There's never usually one party that is entirely to blame. And we have this picture of the Indians circling around and joining. The, the Indians wanted Europeans to come. Many of the Indians wanted Europeans to come and give them technology and expertise and bring them to the European world and establish trade. Unfortunately, though, you have individual men, individual conquistadors and colonists taking advantage of that. Um, but then you have other people like like Las Casas or, or Modolini, Modolina, who truly did just want to enlighten the natives with the light of the gospel. And you could say that even that, even evangelism is a form of colonialism, but I won't go that far because I don't actually yeah, think one that. One historian that said basically the difference between what happened in the United States in the early colonies and what happened in Mexico and Northern uh, South America was that the people that came to the new world, you know, the, becomes the United States for coming there. 